We're not real brothers, we're sports brothers, and this week one of our favorite sports sisters, Jessica Mendoza, is on the show. Bob Saget is not a pedophile, and strip clubs will save us from the coronavirus. Here we go. This is Sports Brothers, coming to your ear holes and eye holes from the Parish Healthcare Podcast Studio. So welcome into the March 11th episode of Sports Brothers. We do have Jessica Mendoza on the show from ESPN. We'll talk baseball. We will, of course, talk coronavirus. we got our Sports <laughs> Brothers of the Week. Good tweet, yeah. bad tweet, degenerate brothers. And still, shirts. We have them here modeling for you on the right. show right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you can check us out on Twitter. C. Brewery WFTV, J. Kepner WFTV. If you want to get a look at those shirts, we've got them up there. And we will be doing another giveaway this weekend surrounding the Orlando City match against Chicago. Chicago. Guess the score and the first line to score, and we will mail you a shirt. Oral City Fan, ORL City Fan, was the first winner last week. Congratulations. All right, so. let's get it into uh, Sports Brothers of the Week. You want to go first? Yeah, I'm going to go with Bob Saget. And like I said in the intro, Bob <laughs> Saget is the Sports Brother of the Week, one of, because he is not a pedophile. It, I know that's a very low bar. <laughs> it is a very low bar. But he he got over that bar. Uh, for a moment on Tuesday, Bob Saget was trending on Twitter um, because uh, Corey Feldman, one of the two Corys from the 90s, made a documentary. He's been saying for years that um, that there's this sort of underworld of pedophilia in Hollywood um, and that he was someday going to reveal more about that. Well, apparently he made a documentary and in that documentary, he named a bunch of people. Bob Saget was not one of the names in that documentary, um, but there were some others. If, I'm not going to say the names, but if you want to go look them up, go look them up. Um, but somebody who was at this private showing of the documentary then tweeted the names and included Bob Saget. Um, so accusing Bob Saget of being a pedophile. So Twitter goes nuts, like, oh my gosh, Bob Saget's a pedophile. Then all of a sudden everybody's like, no, he's not. He wasn't in the documentary. So then it's a rush to clear Bob Saget's name yeah. on Twitter. And then it becomes, why is Bob Saget trending on Twitter? And everybody logging on saying, oh, oh no, Bob Saget died. It's, it's the only reason people trend anymore. Yeah. Well, seemingly. Bob, Bob Saget didn't die. Didn't die. Not a pedophile. It was a good day for him. Yeah. <sighs> and, and also a bad day for the first part of it. Yeah. So, Bob, uh, guilty of lame jokes on America's Funniest Video. Not guilty of being a pedophile. Yeah. One of uh, America's favorite sitcom dads from Full House. Yeah. Then has gone on to a... a dark just you know really sexually driven comedy i remember career. learning as a kid that bob saget was not as wholesome as he was on full house yeah. that his stand-up comedy was like really filthy and thinking that that can't be right is bob saget they wouldn't they wouldn't let him on that show if he was that kind and then i heard some of his stand-up and wow it's rather raunchy, but yeah. right up my alley. I, yeah, I, yeah. I do enjoy Not, some Bob I think Saget. I definitely enjoy Bob Saget's stand-up more than I enjoy Full, Full House, House reruns. Yes, without I did yeah. not watch Fuller House either, but was yeah. he even a part of that? I don't know. I don't think Didn't so. watch it either. All right, let's uh, my sports brother of the week. I'm going to go with Larry Walker. I, I have an affinity for the backup backup goalies in the <laughs> NHL. Larry Walker, well, you know, we did David Ayers a couple weeks ago when he filled in for the Carolina Hurricanes. Larry Walker was recently elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame, but on Saturday, he's going to be the emergency backup goalie for the Avalanche against the Las Vegas Golden Knights. So um, pretty cool to see a Baseball Hall of F Famer now. It's not just some Zamboni driver. <laughs> it's not some financial consultant from Chicago who did it for the Blackhawks a couple years ago. Uh, we got a legitimate athlete who's past his prime for sure, uh, but he grew up in Canada, dreamed of being a professional hockey player. Now he sort of gets to live out that dream. If you're Larry Walker, are you rooting for injuries while you're sitting in the stands waiting possibly for that call? I think you're rooting for injuries or for guys to just be like a little too hungover from the night before <laughs> so you can get in the game. Maybe this is a thing, though, that like when you get into a Hall of Fame, like that's one of the rewards. You get this really nice bust, you get a jacket, and also you get one moment in another sport at their okay. highest level. I like it. Yeah. And Larry Walker, so grew up in Canada, hockey, obviously king up there. He was like an avid junior hockey player, wanted to be a hockey player for a long time, didn't make the team like a couple of times, and then that's when he decided to play baseball. Who's the crossover? Who's the Hall of Famer in a sport that you would like to see play in another sport? I mean, I would like to see Michael Jordan playing Football. Oh, I was going to say baseball. <laughs> <laughs> We've already seen that. Yes, yes. All right, I'll take uh, Secretariat playing basketball. Taco Fall playing 
football. Oh, that'd be kind of fun too. In the XFL for three point plays where he just like runs 10 <laughs> yards and then you just throw yeah. it as high as possible. Yes. Yeah. I'll take that. All right. My uh, next sports brother of the week, Danny White. If you don't know who Danny White is, he is the guy who declared a national championship for UCF. He's their athletic director has been since 2015. And since he has been there, everything that man has touched has turned to gold literally that the fundraising at that university has skyrocketed. It was, it doubled from 2018 to 2019 to 32 million, um, which was like four times from when he first got there. The coaches that he's hired, Scott Frost, uh, takes them to a national championship. Josh Heupel has them right back in the Fiesta Bowl, but not just in football, basketball. They've had unprecedented success in the NCAA tournament, baseball, softball, volleyball. Do they have volleyball? I don't know. Yes. Um, all of these sports, also good. soccer, their soccer teams are both better um, because of the guys he's hiring. So he gets a new contract just over 1 million, 1.0815 million, making him the UCF athletic director, the highest paid athletic director in the state of Florida. That is, me. I know, I, I get it. It doesn't that, shock me because he does deserve it, yeah, but he, the fact that Scott Strickland, it. who has done a fairly good job at Florida in the limited yeah. time he's been there, that that role does not warrant a right. little bit more than what we saw. I thought he sure. would maybe be making 1.25. Well, and Florida State, I mean, they're great at everything. I know the football team's been down a little yeah. bit, but basketball team's great this year. Their baseball team's great that every good. year. Yep. They they are just like, they're one of those programs that if you're in charge of that program, that athletic director spot, you should be making a ton of money. I'm, I don't know what they make, but I'm sure it is. Uh, Miami, maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> but you and, look at the, the clauses. Yeah. I looked at the bonus clauses in uh, Danny White's contract. He gets up to 25% um, an increase on his base salary if he hits all of his clauses, but the like 10% if he wins a national championship. There's academic clauses. Um, and then there's a rollover clause, which is the craziest thing to me, that it's a five-year contract, but every year it adds another year. So it's always a five-year contract, yeah. which it's, it's, who it's gets an, that? It's an indefinite contract. How do it's I It's a never-ending contract. I don't think Channel 9 would ever give you anything like that. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> it's crazy. But, um, you know, high buyout. And then the one of the coolest things in it, and, and this is a goal that might be impossible to reach, but if anybody can get it, it's him. If he adds $20 million in fundraising from the previous year, so next year if he got to $52 million, he his base salary increases by a million dollars. Is that... Media money, or is that strictly fundraising? I think that was for fundraising. So difficult goal. Like I said, he had to double it to get up to 32. So he only increased by 16, but he'd yeah. have to increase another $20 million, which, I mean, if you're UCF, you'd happily pay out a million dollars if Danny White could bring you 52 million That's next true. year. That's true. Yeah. I also like he got a, a country club membership, yeah. I believe, in this. Yeah, country, $900 for a car, a stipend for a car every month, country club membership. Um, yeah, so again, Danny White, that whole we're declaring a national championship thing, working out pretty well for him. For him, indeed. Yeah. All right, I'll go with Al Michaels. Uh, there was all the rumors kind of late last week that ESPN was interested in talking trade, media trade, for Al Michaels from NBC to bring him back to the Monday night football booth. The word is they want to pair him or wanted to pair him with Peyton Manning. NBC has declined ESPN's inquiries. I just love that we're doing media trades and that this is actually a thing. Uh, but Al, good enough, going to stay put at Sunday night football as a 75-year-old, apparently has a couple more years on his contract. <laughs> but I also wanted to, to have Al as my... Sports brother, for this story that I don't think maybe got as much publicity as it should because it happened back in 2005 mm -hmm. when social media wasn't as big of a thing. I had never heard it. I, I'm sure there were some people that heard it, but he got traded from ESPN to NBC in 2005 for Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. It's a cartoon. I, I don't understand. So NBC had that cartoon. Universal had acquired that cartoon in some way. It was the precursor to Mickey Mouse and yes. the Disney family. I guess when Bob Iger was going to trade Al Michaels, NBC wanted Al Michaels so badly, Bob talked to whoever was kind of handling the trade talks yeah. and said, get me Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Have they done anything with Oswald, though? I don't think so. I think it was just to have it in Disney's grasp or you know, because yeah. it was originally one of Walt Disney's uh, 
original drawings or whatnot. But now I wonder, like, would the Avengers, if if Universal, NBC Universal could get the Avengers, would that be <laughs> enough for Al Michaels? I would think so. I would think, like, you wouldn't even need to give all the Avengers because Al Michaels in the twilight of his career. Yeah, you're probably getting a couple years. Right. I think even, like, you don't even need, who, like, the who? main four. Right. I think you could get away with like Hawkeye, you know, and we'll give you Hawkeye for. I don't think that's enough. You don't think. How about how about Hawkeye and a bad guy? You get Hawkeye and the uh, Thanos. Yeah. He's Hawkeye. Dead though, right. Well, he yeah, he, he I'm was. I'm sure there's a way they could. Spoiler bring him alert. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe Hawkeye, whoever the next Iron Man is. We'll okay. go with that, right? You don't and get you don't get Spider Tony Man. Stark. You're gonna get like a no, Spider you don't get Spider Man. Spider Man's one of the big ones. Uh, yeah, no, you do. You get like a defender to be named later, okay. maybe Daredevil eventually. All right, it's a good trade. <laughs> I like that trade. All right, let's go. Good tweet, bad tweet. Um, this is a tweet from McLovin from the Dan Patrick Show, uh, Andrew Perloff on Twitter. Uh, but there's this beef going back and forth between Charles Barkley and Draymond Green. I feel like it just mm-hmm. gets kind of stirred up every year but yeah uh, Charles was on uh, the Dan Patrick show recently and he said Draymond Green is a nice guy he's a good player but he's like the least important guy in a boy band he doesn't realize he's standing next to Justin Timberlake so people feel bad for all of the other NSYNC members as Charles <laughs> yeah. Barkley just throws Joey Fatone and Lance Bass and J.C. Chazé under the bus here. Uh, but just such a you, great You had analogy. to look those up, didn't you? I remember those three. There's one Chris something that I don't remember. I don't even remember. I Sorry, remember Chris. Joey Fatone. Yeah. yeah. All but, right. um, he's got a hot dog stand down in uh, Florida Mall. Joey does. <laughs> all right. Um, but so, yeah, you, you feel bad for those guys. Uh, but it w- came out because Draymond's you know, Barkley was talking about about Draymond. Draymond said he could do Charles Barkley's job. Charles fires back. So it's a yeah. pretty good back and forth beef going on between Barkley and, and Draymond. Two guys that are not shy about talking. Yeah, I'm I'm all in on this one. It's it's one of the best media beefs and sports media beefs out there. But let's let's be clear about this though. Charles Barkley thinks that he is Justin Timberlake, right? Like that's what he's kind of pointing out there. He's subtly saying, I'm Justin Timberlake. You're one of the backup guys. True. And and maybe in all fairness, back in his no, days no, with the Phoenix Suns, Charles Barkley was Justin Timberlake. He was the he, guy you would go to pay to see for those won, teams. He never won a championship. Never won a and championship. that's where Draymond gets him, gets him there on the, on the titles and the rings. And then know. obviously Barkley goes back with the, you're yeah. the sidekick. Which, if, if you're watching this, like... Charles Barkley is going to win this beef, right? Like he had the better career. He was the better. He's the Hall of Famer. Um, but it's always going to bother Chuck that he didn't get a ring. Like oh, Draymond's sure. always going to be able to just needle him with that. And I think that's why he comes back so yeah. hard. And and on every show that he's on, he's talking trash. Yeah. And if I'm Draymond, I'm just like tweeting a picture of tweeting that little ring emoticon at him every day. Just, yeah. just to get to them. All right, bad tweet. Bad tweet. Uh, this is how we're going to get into our uh, coronavirus coverage, which is uh, you know very impactful in the world of sports right now. But we're going to start with Darren Ravel, um, the sports business guru. I, I don't even know what this guy actually does. Um, but he sends out a tweet comparing the stats for coronavirus to the stats for the flu. And you've probably seen like your you know, uncle or whatever, tweet something similar, put it on Facebook, similar. But then like the problem with it is everybody comes at him like, what are you trying to say here? And Darren Ravel just sort of, I don't know, shrugs it off, says, oh, I'm not saying anything. I'm just tweeting out the stats. Nope. Not saying that it's not dangerous, not saying anything. Like he won't like back up what he's saying. He's obviously trying to minimize it and trying to say like, there's no reason to panic. There's, this isn't a problem. The flu's the real problem. Um, But like I said, we've seen a ton of people do this and I don't really understand it. And look, I don't know how many people coronavirus will kill. I also don't know how many people Darren Ravel will kill. So I guess that's a valid comparison too. Um, but it is fun to pile on Ravel, but I mean, Ravel uh, is, is no, no, but it's fun to pile on Ravel. It's, it's fun yeah. to pile on Ravel. I think he's at the action network. He left ESPN yeah. after, uh, but yeah, his tweets are usually interesting. Mm-hmm. This one, it did, it, it fell under the category of whoever in your family or someone from your hometown trying to downplay something that is having a major impact. We yeah. still don't know the scope of it because the tests, the number of tests in the United States alone are not there. We've just sure. recently starting to get those. So we're going to get more. Yeah. 
numbers that are accurate about how big this is. And we continue to see more and more uh, sports, because we are a sports podcast, yeah. being impacted by this. And just uh, there are probably numerous things from the time that we end this podcast recording to the time that it gets uploaded new stuff will have come out about what how it's impacting sports. Yeah, and just one more note about the tweet from Darren is that I, I guess what I don't understand is what are people trying to say? And that's what people were asking Darren. What are yeah. you trying to say with this? Because I, I guess essentially you're saying like we don't need to worry about this until it gets to flu levels. Like I don't need this but thing to the, kill tens of thousands of people before we start washing our hands and social distancing a little more. But you could obviously compare the percentage is higher with coronavirus. And that's why there is yeah, the concern versus sure. the flu. And the it's got exponential growth yes. and we don't have a vaccine. It's going like literally the only way we can stop this thing from growing right now is social distancing, meaning not having enormous crowds everywhere, yeah. washing our hands and just practicing all the good practices that the news is telling you that they're getting from the CDC and the World Health Organization. Like that's all anybody's trying to say is just, you know, pay attention to this because it is a big deal. And yeah, maybe don't go on that flight. Don't go on that cruise. <laughs> Stay yeah. out of big crowds. Um, I thought it was, we did a story, Channel 9 did a story last night. Uh, one of our reporters went out to the villages and villages is a place that skews older. It's a retirement community. And they were having a get together with bands and dancing. And there was like a thousand people there. And we interviewed a few of them and they were like, man, we're not really worried about it. Maybe you should be worried about it a little you, more than that. You, you don't need you to. You can't be, tell yeah. them what they should and should not be worried about, but it is surprising that they are not worried about. That. Yeah, we don't need to be like pulling our hair out and running around in the streets screaming naked, but like maybe the appropriate response is somewhere between clothed, going crazy, going <laughs> crazy, and eh, we're not really worried about it. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. It's also we talked to what one or two people there. Yeah, you know that that man on the street said that yeah it's not always indicative of but everybody there clearly isn't that worried about it yeah so but anyway let's get to the sports angle of this because you're right like in the last hour yes we have had two major updates before we were recording this podcast the warriors are going to play their next game in front of no one at their new billion dollar mm -hmm. arena against the brooklyn nets the seattle mariners have said that they're going to play probably their first two weeks at somewhere else because of the issues with Seattle being a hot spot for the coronavirus. So two mate, two big teams, Warriors and Mariners, two top of the yeah. uh, heat professional leagues are well, making these changes. Maybe not so much the Mariners. <laughs> yes. The fact that it's Major League Baseball yes. and the, the NBA, which yeah. are in season right now, making these changes is pretty incredible, especially mm -hmm. after what we've seen this week from Italy canceling all sporting events until, what, the beginning of April – and yeah. they can reassess. First time Syria has been canceled since World yeah. War II. I think that puts it into a little bit of a perspective. And uh, yeah, the NCAA tournament, is that next? I I feel like something is coming down the pike for that one because the, the Big West Conference and the MAC have already said they're going to play their entire conference tournaments without spectators. The Ivy League canceled their tournament, but only four teams in their men and women's tournament get yeah. in. So you really, you're only talking six games. That's not a huge financial loss for them. Uh, UCLA playing all sporting events without... Um, without spectators for the foreseeable future. Cincinnati canceled its spring game. Like the list is getting really, really long, yeah. but the one everybody is kind of wondering about is the NCAA tournament, because unlike all of those other events, the NCAA tournament, maybe more so than any other sporting event in the U S it gets people on airplanes to other cities, flying back and forth, intermixing with crowds of, of people from all over the United States. Like, I mean, it is, it's basically like having a major conference in a whole bunch of different cities, and then they all get up and shift around for next weekend's conference. Well, yeah, and, and possibly canceling those, or you know, yeah. if you close it off and you only play the games with no fans, the, the economic impact is huge. As we've yeah. reported here, there was a conference in Daytona. I believe there's been some in uh, the Orange County Convention Center that have been canceled. And we know the economic impact is what drives this community here in Orlando specifically. But yeah. uh, you talk, we know, I think uh, it's tens of millions of dollars, the NCAA tournament's economic impact when they've had it here in Orlando. So um, that's a lot of money. The advisory committee that the NCAA has set up uh, I read is meeting twice a day, mm -hmm. compared it 
I thought this was interesting. They compared it to a hurricane because they don't know if it's going to fizzle out or turn or if it's going to be a Category 5, but they need to meet and they need to get ready. And I think that's interesting because I, we've seen that recently here yeah. in Central Florida with the media tells you what could happen. Tom Terry tells you what could happen, and then it may turn or it may not, but why not be prepared? Just don't buy all the toilet paper. <laughs> this toilet paper is just getting I don't know why people think they need so much toilet paper. The other thing that bothers me about this is the timing of it could not be worse because it's allergy season and everybody's telling me not to touch my face. <laughs> Off. <laughs> I cannot not. I'm constantly just, rubbing my I, eyes and my nose and everything. And like I, ah, oh, I just it, it couldn't. Like coronavirus knew what it was doing oh, when it was sure. like, or COVID nineteen knew what it was doing when it was like, yeah, I'm going to time this out with allergy season. It, it's hilarious because it's it's in the newsroom the the second someone sneezes, it's, <laughs> who is that? Yeah, which one was that? I need to stay away from that person. It's, and it's been me. My allergies <laughs> have been awful this yeah, year. Mine have been too. I, I, yeah. I went and bought Zyrtec or whatever yep. brand, CVS brand it was, and I've been popping those like uh, Skittles. <laughs> like I, I think it says one, one time, one a day is what it says. But yeah, hey, why not try two? <laughs> if one works, why not ten? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's. Uh, what about the access in locker rooms at NBA games? <laughs> the NBA is ridiculous because. We can't get near the players for the media, right? You have to keep this six to eight foot buffer. But then you watch the games yeah. and right next to the coach is a bunch of fans, literally inches away, like rubbing elbows. Right behind the team is like the staff, fans. the row of staff, and then fans. Yes. And then on the other side of the bench, fans right there. Like if the goal is to protect the players, get the fans away from the players. And if the goal is to say that like this is so dangerous, we don't want to contribute to the spread of it. Why are you having 18,000 people in your arena still anyway? If you're taking it that seriously, maybe it's time to really look at it and say like, yeah, we need to play these games without fans because you're not just putting threatening to spread it to your fans, like your own employees, right? Yeah. Your ushers, your vendors, like all of these people have to interact with all of these fans. You're just contributing to the spread of it. So if the concern is that this thing is dangerous, we need to protect our players, maybe also show some concern for everybody else. But limiting the media makes sense too. Sure, it does. No, I, I don't I don't have any problem with them saying like you can't come in the locker room. Yeah, it's, for now. Yeah, I for just now. hope because I've I've seen some people saying why is that allowed at all? And I think it is there Sometimes are I times, wonder that too, yeah. But but I think there is something that you get out of if you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and yeah. if it's maybe even off the record, you get either story ideas or you get a little bit more context about certain things. And if we only get the certain one star or the certain players that the yeah. team wants to roll out in front of us, you're never going to get any sort of clarity or uh, information on other aspects of the team that you may get. Uh, with access to the locker room. So I, I'm hoping the NBA has guaranteed that they will that reopen temporary. the locker rooms whenever this coronavirus it, it gets under control. Hopefully it does sooner rather than later. Um, but I just do hope that they just don't keep it how this is because they try it and it works out for a little while. Yeah, okay. Uh, the one other thing that we were going to talk about with the coronavirus I just remembered is that there is a strip club in Tampa. <laughs> Um, Deja Vu Strip Club in Tampa is giving 10,000 masks, medical masks, to customers who come in. Um, this same company is offering free hand sanitizer at a club in Vegas. You thought I was about to say something different. Uh, and, you know, chances are... The, the reason this works with a podcast about sports is because we know there are athletes who have gone to this strip club, <laughs> right? Like, and there will be more that'll go to the strip club. And now we know they won't get coronavirus, at least not from the strip club. And it's always good advice to take protection with you to a strip club. The fact that the mask <laughs> isn't actually, you know, helping as we've heard, unless you yeah. actually have the coronavirus, yes, then wear your mask too. Yes. And don't go to the strip club either. Yes. Stay at home. And wear your mask. Also, if if I'm not saying that you should try to get the coronavirus, but if you're going to be quarantined for two weeks, the day to start, March 17th, you would get through all of the play-in games and every NCAA tournament game up to the final four. And you throw in the and Masters soon after that. And you, you don't you even have to stay a little longer. True. And you don't even have to get a vasectomy. Yeah. There you go. And you can still procreate. Yep. I'm going to I'm gonna come in like on the 17th, that Tuesday, with like fake wheezing 
just so I can go home and, and watch basketball for the next two weeks. No, I'm not. Take it seriously. Do what the CDC and everybody's asking you to do. Social distancing. Wash your hands. All right, let's get to our interview with Jessica Mendoza, ESPN's Jessica Mendoza. Uh, great interview with her. And uh, after that, we'll have the Degenerate Brothers, an mm -hmm. update on the XFL, and we'll play that fantastic game. What is it? Uh, is, is this an XFL player or, and this week it is, the real name of a superhero? All right. And we got dad jokes after the interview with Jessica Mendoza. Enjoy. Right. So now we are joined by ESPN baseball analyst, trailblazer, and two-time Olympic medalist Jessica Mendoza. Jess, uh, thanks for coming on. And you recently signed an extension with ESPN just right off the top. I know that your roles are changing a little bit for those listening. Uh, where are we going to be able to see you now with this new role, so to speak? Uh, you're going to see me on weekday baseball games, still doing MLB, um, but really a, a much larger studio presence. So Shows like Get Up, First Take, and of course Sports Center. Um, so between those three, I'll be doing a lot more nice. baseball and honestly just overall sports coverage. But um, features a variety of different things. Um, in fact, I just finished up a big feature that aired today on Sports Center on Rachel Balkovec, who's the new Yankees hitting coach yeah. at the the Gulf Coast League. Um, so I was out there in Florida shooting that. Um, but the, it's really like close to my heart is being able to tell these stories and. I look forward to being able to tell a lot more. Yeah, how excited are you for that, that you get to do something a, a little bit different, but it, as you said, clearly uh, close to your heart. Is, your, is it going to be kind of these female trailblazers most of the time, or will it be any sort of features? Uh, you know, honestly, I'm looking for just kind of harder features, the ones that aren't as, you know, easy telling, feel good, but some that are a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I know I did – one last year with Clayton Kershaw, we traveled down to the Dominican and kind of tapped into his passion to help end um, child sex trafficking, which was a very complicated piece, um, very emotional being in the Dominican and being around these young girls and prostitutes and all these different, um, you know, when you're talking about Clayton Kershaw is, is identified as one of, if not the best pitcher of our generation. And here he is down in the Dominican and this piece that we did was just so like interwoven with all this stuff. Um, it was fun. It was fun to do. So yeah, I definitely don't tend, I don't want it to be just about women. I want it to be about just really great, sometimes complicated um, stories that kind of give you a little bit and actually a lot of insight into who these athletes are. Jessica, it sounds like you're you're kind of ready to evolve beyond this role of trailblazer. It's an important role to inspire the next generation of young women coming up. Um, but it sounds like you're ready to go beyond that a little bit in your career here. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we all do, right? We just continue to evolve with, you know, whatever's next. And I'm so grateful for the opportunities to I never dreamed of even being on Sunday Night Baseball, um, just growing up listening to it and being such a fan of it. You know, I just wanted to be a part of the game. And I was blessed enough to have almost five years in that booth. And how much I enjoyed it was, I mean, only telling and that I did really nothing else. <laughs> like, I was so consumed by that weekly game, those two teams and what we're going to do. It's a big show. And, you know, I obviously don't regret any of that. I enjoyed so much of it. But... I've just been itching to really continue to expand beyond baseball, beyond softball, um, and just really be able to dive into a lot of different areas. And what's cool about ESPN is owned by Disney, and there's just a lot of different places to explore. Um, so we'll see where I end up maybe landing. I don't know if it'll be just one spot, to be honest. It might be four or five throughout the year and doing a lot of different things. I thought it's been really cool to see – you mentioned the Clayton Kershaw story and – but I feel like when you go and do these segments where you're at spring training or you're with a team for a while and you're talking, hitting, how quickly the players just, I don't know, gravitate to you or open up to you. How do you feel like you've been able to, I guess, gain their respect when you're doing these segments? Is it just because it is baseball and you know baseball because you were so great at softball? How have you been able to do that so well? I think just listening. I mean, one of the things I feel like I learned coming into baseball was not coming at a lot of these players um, with, hey, like, I want to do a feature, or hey, like, I, you know, hey, Aaron Judge, can we um, go talk about why you're such a great hitter? But really, like, 
I mean, like Aaron's a great example. I mean, I've been wanting to do something with him for a long time, as has everybody, right? But my thing is just building this relationship and trust. And he's just very, you know, hesitant to just put himself out there. I mean, he's already out there as it is, but he's hesitant to, you know, make it about him. He's a great teammate, you know, all these things. But, you know, I've really gotten to know his parents. Um, his dad and I went to the same high school. Um, he's from the area my dad went to, to college. Like, there's all these crazy connections with him. And half the time I'm around him, I really just listen. Instead of just trying to get information from him, it's more of like, how's your day? Like, what is going on with you? And just really trying to get to know, like, who these guys are as people. And then I feel like I wait for kind of that moment where maybe he says something about his mom that just triggers something me as a mom. And I'm like, you know what? Most people are going to want to hear this. Mm -hmm. And then getting his trust, not only from him, but also his mom or his dad to maybe tell and expand on that story. And I don't know, like it, it, it's hit and miss. And you guys know this just as well as I do. It's like you build these relationships and sometimes, you know, it works out where on screen people can get to know them the way that you have. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, my biggest goal is for them to let their guard down. And I always tell them going in, um, I don't want you to do this piece if you don't want to, or you don't feel comfortable because the last thing I want to do is have it be that, like, here's the cliche, here are the token responses, <laughs> you know, here's my monotone voice talking about something that you're passionate about, but I'm not going to give you anything. Like, no, I'd rather you not do it. So I always tell them, look, if it's not now, I get it, but I would want you to be excited to tell this story. And I think that to me, and even if it's just a hitting piece, yeah. you know, I want to tell you about how I hit an outside pitch. I want you to get excited about it. And, and be passionate and give me information. But if you're just going to be like, well, like, put the ball in the feet. You know, it's like, okay, no, we're good. Yeah, I like that approach. How much are you hoping um, on the, with these midweek games, the weekday games, how much are you hoping to be on Astros games this season? <laughs> um, I don't think it's a hoping to be on Astros games as much as it is just, you know, I want to be where, you know, the best games are and I yeah. think with the Astros I know ESPN's opening up that first Thursday the games I mean the Astros will be um, you know on our air I think there's a ton of Sunday night Astros games as well just because as we all know there's a lot of story to tell there yeah. I, I think my thing is, is I'm, I'm actually hoping that this story isn't what is driving baseball news by the time we really get into the season I get it will in the beginning um, and it will always continue to be newsworthy. But the fact that it's number one on everyone's minds when they think of Major League Baseball, I feel like we will be doing it as a service if by July it's still the same. But if we're not talking about division leaders and other stories that are happening and really the game itself, and it's still about trash banging and, and cheating, um, then I think that the game isn't being told the right way. The only reason I think we might still be talking about it by then, though, is just because I feel like all-star voting, this story is going to come up over and over with all-star yeah. voting um, with other players. Are they going to vote for the Astros? Are the fans going to vote for these? You know, is Altuve going to be an all-star this year? Like, who's who's getting in from the Astros? Yeah, no, and I, I mean, I think even as we head into the postseason, it, it's always going to be there. Like, yeah. and I think five years from now, it's going to be something we're talking about still. And you got to remember, too, we're still waiting with the Red Sox, you know, trying to find out more there and, like, all that investigation, you know, everything that still needs to come out. I think this isn't the end. It doesn't end with the Astros. I think there's going to be a lot more information, not even just the Red Sox. I think we might find out, you know, who knows, other teams. I think it, it's going to continue to be a conversation. I guess I'm just trying to, like, be hopeful that we can also talk about, like, the cool – like technology that we're doing in some of the games and, and breaking down stuff. And I get it. It'll never be X and O's driven. People want the newsy, gossipy, cool stuff. And to be honest, like this is a storyline we'll continue to follow. I just, I hope that it'll get, you know, fun baseball stuff too. Is it surprising though? Because uh, you talk about the technology and the, what you guys have done in spring training has been fantastic with the interviews, but Anthony Rizzo's comment about, can someone bang for me automatically captures the headline or Trevor Bauer tipping his pitches by just throwing his glove and letting the batter know exactly what it is. Have you been surprised that the players are almost continuing the narrative and taking every almost opportunity they get to take another shot? You know, it's funny. I am a little surprised. I would say normally I wouldn't be just because it's such a hot topic for mm -hmm. everybody. 
but I would say baseball of all sports, the players tend to just kind of be in the back, right? In the background when mm-hmm. it's a big news story. They don't speak up on it. They don't tend to talk as vanilla as possible seems to be the goal sometimes. And this entire off season leading to spring training has shocked me with how vocal players have been. And we've heard from the biggest names and what they've said, the fact that they're not okay. And to be honest, I mean, Anthony and Chris Bryant, I mean, even there were times we were about to come out back on air and they're like, Hey, can you guys tell us what's fine coming? Or like, they were totally just joking around. Yeah. And our producer's like, what's not like, say this. <laughs> who I was working with, he's like, yeah, if it's fastball, like, you're just totally messing around. This is before we were on air. But our producer was like, can you please not do this in the game? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we yelled, fastball's coming, you know, whatever. Even though we're all having fun and it's in jest and obviously, like, tongue-in-cheek yeah. with the Astros, we all know the headline the next day and then how, obviously, this it would not have been as funny. So I feel like I have been surprised by how the players have been so vocal, but you're also getting to see a little bit of how they feel. And honestly, mm-hmm. the fact they don't want this to just go away. The the interaction with the booth and the players mic'd up, and I know a lot of people are pushing now for the yeah. ESPN to continue doing this, try and get Major League Baseball to allow you guys to do this during the regular season. Can you let us in on possibly any of those talks? Because uh, we hear baseball needs help and the ratings and everything, and uh, it's been fantastic. Yeah. And all of it has been amazing. And then Freddie Freeman, when he was going from first to home, was so right. good. Uh, it's it's all it's just been fly. yes, it was. It's been so great. Can could we expect to possibly see more of that? I mean, it's what's cool is that Major League Baseball also wants it. So okay. it's it's not just the entertainment side of it, and the fact that more people clearly. I mean, that's a no brainer. You would. Well, I had more people reaching out to me. I mean, my own kids. They honestly don't watch baseball, and I showed them those clips, and they're like, "Can we see more?" I mean, they were like, <laughs> "Glue." They're like, "This is awesome." So, I mean, it's a no-brainer that if you want more people interested in the sport, more people to watch, this is clearly some of the things that we need to do. And Major League Baseball gets that they want to do it. Yeah, it's the players' union. It's the owners. It's it's if if Chris Bryant, you know, gets out and he was, I think, 0 for 3 that game, did they look at that and be like, well, he was 0 for 3? If it's a regular season game, you know, like, you know, Mike, no Mike, does it affect the performance of our players? If there's a chance it does, I feel like it's just a quick no all the time. And I just think there's also responsibility. Um, and, and maybe we don't go after all the contending teams. Maybe we get to the point second half of the season, it's like, okay, look, you guys are losing games. Yeah. Like, if we can get Mickey Cabrera mic'd up for a game, you could hear him at first base talking to people and his personality. Like, it, are their owners going to be as concerned about that win in game, you know, 45? You know, maybe not. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can push it with not always the, you know, bigger teams that are contending, but some of the teams that have stars that maybe mm-hmm. aren't, you know, maybe they're in the rebuilding mode. Yeah, I feel like we could really get to know the Seattle Mariners this year that way. He's a, Joe's a Mariners. I'm a Mariners fan, so I get to say that. Um, I do. I did have one more question about the Astros, and then we can move on from them because I have a theory though that everyone thinks the players are going to come out and just be trying to throw at the Astros or hurt the Astros and all of that for retaliation. But then I also think like they're also going to really want to beat the Astros. So Houston's going to get the best effort from every other team this year throughout the entire regular season. I feel like so. I wonder if the Astros then get to the playoffs which, you know, they're still a really good team. They're probably going to get to the playoffs. Um, will they be so tested? Or My theory is they'll be so tested that they will win the World Series because they'll be more tested than any other team once they get to the postseason. How do you like my theory? <laughs> I mean, I like it in the sense that I think from a chemistry level, from, a you know, the things that you hear that really build a team. I mean, the case in point, the, the Nationals, I mean, they were not the best team in baseball by any means last year. They weren't even the best team in their own division, in my opinion. And yet, you watch how they were able to handle, I mean, even just like not having Bryce Harper in like the, the last three years for them. And it's nothing to what the Astros have gone through, but how important them to be able to just come together and freaking battle. I mean, I, I agree in the sense that if they can stay through and withstand everything that's going to come at them this year, and I do still see them as a 90-win team. But if they can get to that point, they can only win 70 because they fall apart. Because they're, you know, it, it can break you at some point. Everyone hates you. And whether that looks like them throwing at you, whether it looks like because teams want to beat you, or it's just fans consistently booing you, social media, 
who so many of those players rely on. They're actually huge on getting fan support and they hate you. And that speaking from someone that's been like come at, you know, from a lot of people, it wears on you. So if they can get to the point in October and they've won 90 games, that tells me they are a team that could win it all. But they lost Garrett Cole, so that's why yeah, I'm, that I'm going against Joe's <laughs> theory, but that's just yeah. my own personal opinion. Here in Florida, I, one of the best rotations is all of Major League Baseball, the Rays. Uh, they unfortunately <laughs> can't get people to go to Tropicana Field, but they win and they win and they win And with Glass now and Martin and Blake Snell. What do you expect from the Rays this year? Because it sounds like maybe they're moving away from the opener that they kind of created. Well, yeah, because they're actually pretty stacked now. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I think- the reason they've had to, and this is where, God, I just, I love the Rays. I love teams like the Oakland A's because they don't have the money. They don't have, but how consistent they have been to figure out what they can do with what they have. And I think one of the beautiful things about the Rays last year was the fact that they can manipulate their pitching, whether it was openers, bullpens, throw at you, any guy, I mean, the matchup. You think about it. They still have that. They have an arm for every bat, right? That the, the teams that they're playing, but now they have more starters. They have more, they just have more people. They're, I think, a better team. And yet they still have in their back po- pocket, if needed, to pull a guy in the fourth inning and take the next five innings and just match up to be able to win. Will any of this matter? Are we going to actually get some baseball or is coronavirus just going to wipe out the whole season at this point? You know, I think every day I'm always shocked at the more and the more and the more. I mean, today I was just on a text chain, you know, about college sports and how, like, you know, most university we're talking Notre Dame, Duke, Stanford, UCLA, North Carolina students can't come back now for spring quarter. And, you know, I was texting with a bunch of athletes um, asking them, like, okay, like, how are you guys handling this? And they're literally like, it's, it's a day by day. Like, they wake up in the morning and students the students that play sports are allowed to return to campus but if you're not in sport you don't and now they're like are we going to have things and that's obviously the college level but i think for these pro sports we've now seen them ban media from the clubhouse yeah Yeah. i think that's an easier decision because it doesn't cost money the fan component guys is the one that i i mean i don't know we all know that money is what drives a lot of decisions and i hate saying that but to me it's like if these if these teams are in, and as a league as a whole, I mean, you're factoring, of course, the liability of this, of the coronavirus, but you're also going to lose a ton of money. So I think the decisions are always going to be, what can we do that's not going to lose us money to lead up to that point, whether it's like restricted, like the way that they choose. Fan, I don't know. Like I, I have no idea. Yeah, but, we, like, I think banning media was like the easier way because it doesn't cost them anything. Yeah, the Mariners going to play their first couple you know, of weeks of couple games, of I weeks guess they're trying to figure out. They, they can't play in Seattle, so they're going somewhere else. I just do wonder how much this really does affect it. And, like, if all of these teams are playing, I, I would think at the very least they're going to be playing parts of their seasons without crowds. And I think that's going to be really hard on a lot of players to know what it's like to be a Miami Marlin. <laughs> <laughs> You don't, have to, you don't have to comment on that. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but your laugh was good because yes. he hit finally a joke. Yes. He's been trying for about 30 episodes of our <laughs> podcast, but he finally got a laugh. Yeah. Well, Jess, uh, I appreciate you coming on and um, talking on a, about a number of things. And uh, always great to see you. I know we're not seeing you right now, but I'm sure we will soon. Yeah, no, definitely. And I appreciate you guys. And yeah, I, I hope to see, honestly, a lot of Tampa because that's uh, one of my favorite teams for this season. Maybe the Orlando Dreamers someday. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks, Jess. Bye, guys. So thanks to Jessica Mendoza coming on. Exciting year of baseball ahead as long as the teams get to play at their home stadiums and coronavirus doesn't ruin us. (sighs) At least it's an outdoor sport, I guess. Not so confined with disease. And no one one goes to Marlins games anyway. (laughs) Or race games, for that matter. Yeah. All right. So let's get to Degenerate Brothers. Uh, I had a rough week last week after an incredible run. Uh, one and three last week, Joe. You know, three being, and one. Yeah, being the smart man he is, <laughs> trying to catch up. I'm 14 and six overall. He's six and 14. So uh, real yeah. quick, my picks. I'm going to take the Roughnecks on the road, six and a half point favorites at the Guardians. I'm going to take the Vipers for the first time maybe all year. Underdog at home against the Battle Hawks. Uh, they had a horrendous, just blown lead. They were up like 17 nothing last week, mm-hmm. and they ended up losing bad. Yeah. All right, I'll take the Defenders <laughs> as uh, four-point favorites at home against the Renegades. I don't believe Landry Jones is back for them yet. And I'll take the Wildcats 
three-point favorites at the Seattle Dragons if that game still actually happens in Seattle. And I think you're going to be wrong on all of those, so I'm going to take all of the opposites. Smart man, smart man. Because that's my only chance here. All right, so let's get into our you know favorite game to play now. It's a XFL player or the real name of a superhero. Okay. Christian has to tell me which one this is here. All right, so XFL player or the real name of a superhero. All right, Nick Hawley. XFL. That is a rough next running back. You are yes. correct. Arthur Curry. Superhero. That is Aquaman's real name. His adopted Seth, name. Seth Curry? Arthur Curry. Arthur Curry. Arthur Curry. Okay. All right. Hank McCoy. Mm. Superhero. That is Beast from X-Men. Yeah, that yeah. Sounds, sounds rather beastly. Colby Pearson. I think that's XFL. That is. That's a Guardians wide receiver. James Barnes. XFL. That is Bucky, Captain America's best friend. Uh, so that's your first miss. You're doing pretty well, though. Oh, we're still going? We'll do one more. Okay. Reese Horn. <laughs> it sounds like superhero, but I'm going to go XFL. That is a Vipers wide receiver. Very good. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Reese Horn, the Vipers wide receiver. That is... That's good. Yeah, so you got most of them. You only I missed one I, this I week. I went five and one. Now. Yeah, I, was, right. I, I thought you were going to miss Arthur Curry. Huh? That's a pretty good one. Okay. Dad jokes? Dad jokes. All right, let's uh, just crash land this sucker <laughs> as we do every week. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, I took a Viagra this morning, but it got stuck in my throat. You know what happened? Had a <laughs> stiff neck all day. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> that's actually a pretty good one. That is. I do. I like that one. Okay, mine's a superhero one. I went with the, the whole superhero okay. theme. Why did Ikea hire Thor, Hulk, and Iron Man? Why? Because Avengers Assemble. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad either. Those are probably, yeah. like, that's probably the best two dad jokes we've ever closed out with. Yeah, yeah. Good delivery on them too, I think. Good for us. Look at yep. this. We got our swag up here. Yeah, hats, we do. Shirts. Once again, follow us on Twitter, Seabrewy WFTV, Jake Kepner WFTV. We are doing a challenge every Orlando City match. All yeah. you got to do is guess the score and who scores first for Orlando City, and we'll send you out a shirt. And or, you, know, you know what? If you want a hat or a shirt that bad, just send us a message. We'll sell you one. I don't. We'll we'll come up with a price. We'll negotiate. Yeah. But uh, if you want one that bad. You know, you know where to find us. Let us know. Social right. media, Instagram, Twitter. You can also listen to the podcast anywhere you want, but also rate and review. Rate subscribe. and review, please. Rate, review, subscribe, and don't forget you can watch the podcast if you want to see the hat and the shirt on the WFTV YouTube page or the WFTV Now app on your smart device. Well done. We'll see you next week. Chris, play the music. <laughs> <laughs>